Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to uh, start this morning with um, Zephaniah 317. Do not fear. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Just that, that last verse there, or that last part, whatever, he will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that just kind of unbelievable? <laughs> but let's just soak that in and let's return that, rejoice and give our glory to God this morning as we sing and praise. So um, yeah, please stand and join us here. Or greet one another and then we'll start singing. <laughs> near to you, O Lord, with a true heart and a full assurance of faith. Amen. Thank you. 
I need help, Jackson. Come on, buddy. He's hiding. Okay, then I need audience participation. Okay, this is the dividing line. So you need to visualize, okay? Your mom gives you two really, really, really warm cookies and tells you to take them over to the neighbor's house. And they look really good. And they say, give them to the neighbor lady. And you're on your way and you think, she'd be kind of happy with just one cookie. Maybe I'll eat this other one. If you would give her both cookies, you're on this side of the room. And if you'd eat one on the way, you're on this side of the room. Now I'm looking at some guilty faces, so I'm just assuming. Okay, now I've got another question. Your, and this was designed for kids, so you got to think young. Um, you've got uh, a handful of gummy bears, and you're told to share them with your brothers and sisters, and you have to divide them evenly. And when you get all done, there's a couple extra that you could probably break in half and make it fair. If you would eat them, you need to be on this side of the room. And if you would break them and make them fair, you need to be on this side of the room. Or... You're walking down the street, you're at a park or something, and you see a wallet. And you reach down, you pick it up, and there's no identification, no license, no nothing, but there's a $10 bill inside. Do you take it to the authorities, or do you pocket the bill? Guess which side of the line you're on. Our lesson today from Jesus, um, it's a confusing lesson, but one part of it's pretty clear. It says, those who are trusted with little can be trusted with a lot. Can we pray? Holy God, I just thank you for um, putting your Holy Spirit in our hearts, putting your law in our hearts so that we know right from wrong, Lord. Help us to step up and to do the right thing in all situations, in teeny tiny little ones and in great big huge ones. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with your wisdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. God be with you today and, and always. Before we begin our readings this morning, let's just collectively take a few moments just for some quiet time. Settle down our minds, open our hearts before we begin our two readings. Guide our thoughts and our actions, Lord, our words and our deeds, so that we will witness to you with our very lives. Teach us your truths, O Lord, and show us how to love deeply, and by this to make your presence known in the world. Give us, Lord, and help us to share that precious gift freely. We ask this. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading this morning is from the New Testament, and we'll be reading from the book of Timothy. It will be chapter 2, 1 through 7, and it's located on page 960 in your few Bibles. The title, Instructions on Worship. I urge then, first of all, 
that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to knowledge and of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. Christ gave himself as a ransom for all people, and this is now and has been witnessed at all proper times for this purpose. I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. I am a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. These are the words of our God. May we hear them, study them, and then place them into our daily lives. Amen. Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. It's found on page 849 in your pew Bibles. It's titled, The Parable of the Shrewd Manager. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he said. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use your wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I'm falling apart here. This is kind of a weird text, isn't it? Remember a couple of weeks ago when the scholars described Luke 14, 25 as a tough lesson? Well, they call today's reading troubling. And I totally agree. This is a bit difficult to understand. Oh, I get the part about no one can serve two masters. God needs to be first and foremost, period. You can't make money or wealth accumulation, some kind of idol. If you do, you'll end up treating the Lord as second rate, you know, the first commandment. And I get the part about whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. That makes perfect sense. But the rest of the parable, especially the part about a shrewd manager, an obviously crooked man, well, that's confusing at best. I guess we'd better wade through it together. And let's start with a question. I love questions. And let's make it a visual question. Let's see if we can actually see what's going on. Are you ready? 
Have you ever had to scramble in order to save your life? What I mean is, imagine standing on the edge of a really high cliff out in the middle of the desert on top of a great big rock, gazing out onto a beautiful vista unfolding before you. Now, feel that rock start to teeter as the ground suddenly shifts beneath your feet. You jump, right? Rather quickly, in fact. I had that happen a couple of years ago out in Moab, Utah. Or picture yourself starting to cross what you thought was an empty street only to suddenly notice a car careening towards you out of the corner of your eye. You'd react, wouldn't you? Immediately, right? You might leap to safety or dive for cover. You wouldn't worry about decorum or form, though. Appearances at a time like that don't matter. You might run like a gazelle or waddle like a pregnant hippo, but you'd move, right? Again, quickly. That is, if you want to survive. Well, the sales manager at a local production plant, a rather shifty fellow, overhears a conversation between the bookkeeper and the owner of the company. They're in the very next room, and the walls are paper thin. So when he hears the word sales department, the manager's ears perk up. He turns and leans in towards the wall. Then he hears over budget, wafting his way. He catches phrases, questionable transaction, criminal behavior, parent embezzlement. And when he overhears the word audit, his heart starts to race. His blood pressure begins to soar. Beads of sweat suddenly appear on his forehead and hands. He quickly leaps from his chair, tiptoes across the room, and ever so subtly closes the office door. Then he dashes back to his computer, pulls up his client list, and frantically starts making phone calls. Apparently, he's in charge of accounts receivable as well because he contacts all the clients and immediately starts making deals. He reduces the balance on their outstanding invoices. He barters percentages and margins, bottom line profits. He says to one guy, look, you owe my boss 900 gallons of oil, about three years salary for an average worker. That's actually about right at the pump right now. Just cut it in half and we'll call it good. He says to another guy, you owe 400 acres of wheat, roughly 1,000 bushels, between eight and nine years worth of wages. Have you seen the price of bread lately? Let's cut that by 20%. And oh, by the way, should I ever need a job? Keep me in mind. In other words, he packs his golden parachute so that when the inevitable happens with his current situation, which most likely will be relatively soon, he has a safe place to land. The ground beneath his feet is shifting and the guy scrambles for cover. But there's a problem. The walls in the office are paper thin, remember? That's how the sales manager got the skinny that he was up a creek in the first place. So now the owner of the company in the next room has likewise gotten an earful, and if it were me, I'd feel doubly betrayed, wouldn't you? Not only has this trusted employee blatantly ripped me off, squandered time and material for who knows how long, but now he's given away accounts receivable. I trusted this guy. I gave him a job, a management position, a good income, but now he's throwing away my resources. It's the owner's turn to get up from his chair. Whatever frustration he had before has grown exponentially, don't you think? He hurries around the corner into the crooked sales manager's office. He quickly closes the door and, wait for it, he commends the man for being shrewd. He pats him on the back. Can you believe it? Up to this point in the story, I think most of us are on board. We're probably tracking with what's being said. We see stuff like this happen all the time. I know an owner of a company who intentionally paid his sales manager 90% of what he thought he was worth because he figured he was going to steal the other 10%. It's business as usual, right? We get it. 
People are selfish. They grab whatever they can, and those wrong respond accordingly. Only this story has a twist. One not common at all. The owner, instead of screaming and threatening and throwing the manager out on his ear, starts praising him for his foresight. You're wise, he says, shrewd. Man of anticipation and action. I have to tell you, I'm really impressed. And right here is where the questions start to fly, at least for me. What do you mean, Jesus? Why would you pat a thief on the back? That's not the way it's supposed to work. You don't commend somebody for taking advantage of you, let alone for giving your money away. Shouldn't this guy have been fired on the spot or at a minimum written up so that when you fire him, you have a whole folder of just cause? Why didn't the owner call the police? Why isn't the sales manager in jail? Let the lawyers handle all the financial restitution. Press charges. Get him out of my sight. No boss in the world would ever stay that calm. I certainly wouldn't, would you? And since God always thinks exactly like we do, he wouldn't either, right? Like I said, the experts call this parable troubling or difficult, puzzling, hard to understand. And I agree. I bet the people listening that day thought the very same thing. So why do you think Jesus told this parable? What's the point? And why did he end it in such a most unusual way? I like to insert myself in the biblical text. You probably know that. It helps me to not only see, but also feel what's really going on. Only that's not easy here. Who are the players in this lesson? I mean, if God is the owner in the story, which seems obvious, then why in the world is he praising a crooked man? And if God is supposed to be the shrewd manager, then how could he be so dishonest? And who then would the owner be? On the other hand, if we're supposed to be the owner, then is this lesson simply about being forgiving and generous? Or are we being told to be ready for action, to plan ahead, to be shrewd like the manager? Are we being encouraged to use all of our worldly wealth and positions of power to win friends and influence people? It's just not clear to me. In fact, I'd have to call it troubling. So I have a confession to make. When I opened my Bible on Monday to start this sermon, I cringed. And then almost immediately, I started to whine. No, not the shrewd manager. That's so hard to comprehend, let alone explain. How am I ever going to preach on that? Why did the lectionary skip over the prodigal son and go to this passage? I like the prodigal son. It's easy to preach on. So I did what any serious theologian would do. I started looking for distractions. That evening, in fact, instead of reading the commentaries, I plopped down in my living room chair and I clicked on the TV. And right there in front of me on the daily news was all this again. Dishonest folks, world leaders, politicians, Hollywood celebrities, business executives, all being lauded for having bad values. People unencumbered by the truth, completely devoid of real facts were being applauded. Corporate graft and insider training were financially rewarded. The people of the world, to quote scripture, were being pretty shrewd in dealing with their own, which might be the point. Don't be like them. So again, I panicked, and I went ahead, and I reached for the scholars, but even that didn't help. Like I said, they call this a troubling text. One commentator suggested that Jesus told this story as a joke, with tongue-in-cheek, maybe winking and smirking as he says, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Only my Bible is not a picture book. So I missed the wink, and therefore I couldn't know that for sure. That's called 
eisegesis, by the way, reading into the text what you want it to say, as opposed to exegesis, reading out of the text what's actually there. Another commentator said that this lesson is liberation theology, that the lesson here is that we need to free those who are oppressed, those who are indebted, who have less than we do by any and all means, regardless of the circumstances. But that author clearly had an agenda. Again, I said Jesus. A third suggested that the text is all about having a single-minded focus on God, which makes sense. But is that all we see in this parable? Several people talked about stewardship and how we need to deal shrewdly with what has been entrusted into our care, and I get that. It's certainly true. But others talked about how the manager was able to think on his feet, you know, quickly formulate a plan and put it into action immediately. Only that seems rather like a worldly point of view, doesn't it? Oh, I realize that more than half of the parables that Jesus shares deals with the use of money and possessions, and one-sixth of every verse in the gospel addresses the topic of wealth management, far more than the topic of sex, by the way. Money's a popular theme in Scripture, and verse 14 does state that Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who, quote, loved money. So I see a stewardship theme. But grace and mercy and forgiveness are also huge topics in Scripture. And this shrewd manager doesn't get what he deserves. That's mercy, right? He actually gets far more than he deserves. That's grace, correct? He's not punished for the wrongs that he's committed. He's rewarded for turning things around. That's forgiveness. Maybe it sounds familiar. But I'm still a bit confused. It even pricks my sense of justice that the crooked manager didn't treat all the debtors the same. One got 50% off of his bill, where the other only got 20. Are you with me? Does this parable seem a bit confusing to you? Jesus does say no one can serve two masters. So the lesson is not about me but rather about what I worship. And he does talk about being welcomed into eternal dwelling. So again, this isn't about this worldly goals. Jesus also makes a clear distinction between the people of this world and the people of the light. We clearly have a heavenly perspective going on. Besides, just prior to this passage, Jesus talks about the cost of being a disciple. He even shares a parable about a great banquet where the invited guests choose not to come. That's followed by three parables in rapid succession, one right after another, about finding things that were lost. You know, there was that sheep, remember, that coin and the lost son. This entire section of Luke's gospel speaks of eternal ramifications. So how's that frame the lesson? And here's something I totally missed at first, something that might possibly explain the rest of the story, came to me in the middle of my panic. What if the sales manager, in being shrewd, is not squandering the owner's resources, but rather using his own? I know, I said Jesus. But what if in his phone conversation with his clients, he's actually given away his sales commission? Does that change anything? What if he's spending what he has, what has been given to him by the owner to assure his future when his current situation ends? Imagine being a wealthy plantation owner in the South during the Civil War. You got all kinds of property and possessions, a mountain of cash buried away in the barn. Problem is, it's Confederate currency, and you know the North is about to win the war. What would you do? Well, if you were wise, even by worldly standards, you'd cash it in, right? 
You might keep just enough Confederate currency to transact daily business, but the bulk of your holdings, as many assets as you could sell, would quickly be invested in a currency that would last. Your world is about to change, and relatively soon, life as you know it is coming to an end. So what you do right now with what you have will determine how you'll come out on the other side. Matthew says it like this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't think Jesus is using irony in this parable, do you? Or for that matter, tongue-in-cheek humor. I think he's talking about the here and now and how it directly affects a much grander eternal stage. Use your worldly resources to gain friends so that you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Be wise with what has been entrusted into your care because those who are faithful with a little can be trusted with a great deal. You only have one life, you know. You only have 168 hours in the week. You only have so much money and so much time and so much talent. So use these things to build the kingdom to introduce people to Jesus. Picture, if you will, arriving in heaven someday and having someone say to you, thank you. Thank you. I'm here because of you. Because of what you said. Because of what you did. Bill Hybels, the pastor of Willow Creek at the time, asked a question in one of his sermons. He said, what are you going to do with the one and only life that you have that will last for eternity? It makes you stop and think, doesn't it? I believe that is what Jesus is asking in this parable. Consider the gifts, the resources, the segments of your time that you've been entrusted with. Then stop and ask yourself, how am I using these things to further the kingdom of God? There's an old fable about a poor man who begged for food. One day he heard that the king was coming to town, so he decided to go out early and get a good place to wait for the king to pass him by. He found a great place and he waited. In his pouch, the poor man had some fruit, a sandwich, piece of meat, a few coins. Finally, the king came down the road. The man jumped up and called out, Good sir, I am one of your poor servants. Take mercy on me and give me a coin. The king looked down and said, First, you give me a gift. The man was shocked, stunned, actually. Angrily, he reached into his pouch and searched. He pushed aside the sandwich and the fruit. He pushed aside the coins. Finally, he found three small cracker crumbs in the bottom of his pouch and gave them to the king. The king went on his way, and the beggar went to his hovel, disappointed. When he emptied his pouch, though, he discovered that there were three gold pieces where the three crumbs had been in the exact size and shape of those former crumbs. Why, he cried, didn't I give my king the best? All that I have. Give, and it'll be given to you, Luke says in chapter 6. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use will be measured back to you. Those who can be trusted with little can likewise be trusted with much. No one, apparently, can serve two masters. I guess maybe some lessons aren't that difficult after all. And all of God's people said, Amen. I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts as we stand and sing, Will you please stand?
I pushed it again. Am I on now, Sarah? She's very tactful. Nobody will know. I'm still freaking out. My pin was gone, and I was just trying to find a second one. We have some additions to our prayer list. Lyle Cook is uh, in Munson from a recent surgery. I'd like to keep him lifted up in our prayers. Nona Nugent uh, was hospitalized this week. She's at Munson as well. 
Larry John Mortensen was also hospitalized this week at Munson. We'd like to keep him in our prayers. Um, Dick and Stana Spalding, Dick's sister, Elaine Reynolds, went home to be with the Lord, so we'd like to keep their family in our prayers. Uh, Lucille Humphreys, um, hospitalized at Munson, had a emergency surgery, I believe, yesterday. Uh, that's Diane Gillison's mom. like to keep her lifted up. The men's uh, retreat at Crystal Conference Center is wrapping up today. We had a number of our people there. I'd like to keep those men in our prayers. Um, Mike Sikansky went home to be with the Lord uh, last week. We'd like to keep his family and friends in our prayers. And Sarah Esper is dealing with some health issues. We'd like to keep her lifted up. Are there others that we would like to share? Jackson, my man. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for the prayers for Jackson. He's uh, improving every day. We're happy. We're glad you're doing good. He was hospitalized this week as well, but he's home and smiling and can't get him to come up for the children's sermon, but he's doing good. Uh, and I just kind of want to explain that. Please. I'm doing a week of off the grid camping with my best friend this coming week. And this is a woman that I've been working on for probably close to 20 years to really commit her life to Christ. And she's she's been this close. And I just pray that you all will give me the strength and the words to say to to bring this woman into a closer relationship with the Lord. We will pray specifically <laughs> for that, Jackie. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no others, could we be in a spirit of silent prayer with one another, please? Well, holy God, God of covenant, God of relationships, God of love, maker of all that is and all that was and all that ever will be. To you, we offer our worship and praise. We proclaim you the Lord of our lives. And so, Lord, we bring before you our silent and corporate prayers. You've searched the depths of our heart. You know our desires, our fears, our longings, and our concerns. You're aware of all that we face. You know us, Lord, even better than we know ourselves. So we ask now for your peace through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Calm our discordant hearts, still the distractions of our minds, settle our relationships, Lord, and pour out peace on your world. We need your guidance and your direction in our lives, Father. So that's what we pray for today. We long to see you more clearly and to follow your will more faithfully so that we too Ask for that in our prayers today. Fill us with wisdom and power, with compassion and love, so that all that we do will bring glory to you. We also pray for our loved ones, Father, lifting up before you Lyle Cook and Nona Nugent and Larry John Mortensen. We place before you the family and friends of Elaine Reynolds and lift up Lucille Humphreys. We place before you the men's retreat, Lord, and the family and friends of Mike Sikansky. We lift up Sarah Esper and Jackson Merrill. And Father, we ask you to be especially with Jackie, praying for blessings and safety, and with her friend, Lord, that she will just uh, open her heart to you. We also lift up those who are on our prayer list right now, Lord, and those who are silently on our hearts. We pray for ourselves as well, for your church and all of its manifestations throughout the world. We pray for our leaders, like Paul tells Timothy, for those that we agree with and for those that we don't. We pray for our president, our senators and representatives, our governors and our teachers, our pastors and our elders, just as Paul says. We pray for the leaders of other countries as well, for Iran and Syria, for Russia and Afghanistan for China and North Korea and the rest of the world. Please, Lord, overwhelm each one of these folks with your love. 
with your healing, with your guidance, and with your peace. For we ask these things in the name of our risen Savior, and we lift them up to you with the very prayer that he has taught to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I alluded to the great banquet in my sermon where um, happened just before today's reading. Jesus uh, tells a parable about people being invited to the great banquet and they had excuses and they didn't come. But one of the excuses was, I just bought a field and I must go and see to it. The other one was, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. And the other one was, I just got married. These aren't feeble flimsy excuses. They're kind of real and serious things. So the lesson here is no excuse is an excuse to not come to the banquet. If you, O oh God, tell our sins and fears, our compromises and our cowardice, against us who could stand but you are a forgiving God you hear us when we cry out to you to lead us to your joyous joy presence we come to this table with eagerness and longing realizing that it is only a taste of the heavenly communion you found the cross On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup and after giving thanks for it, he gave this to the disciples and he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me. Everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God is welcome at this table. Just come forward and break off some bread and dip it in the cup and partake and then gather around the sanctuary for our closing benediction. Come for all things are now ready.
I'd like to remind you that elders are available to talk with you or to pray for you after this service. And then if today's not convenient, they'd love to hear from you throughout the week. Our benediction today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and following. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen.